Again, feel free to use the table of contents at the beginning of your Bibles, or you can uh, flip open to the book of Psalms and just keep turning right, and you'll find it eventually uh, in your Bibles. We've got just this week and next week left in Ecclesiastes before we start a, a new series. And, and last week, as we were in our study, we saw our daily need for wisdom in a fallen world. And in the final two chapters of Ecclesiastes, Solomon is going to focus on our service and devotion to God. And we come now to this chapter, chapter 11, and we are going to consider how it is that we can serve God and give Him our all when we're living in a world that fills us with uncertainties, things that we just don't know. So much we don't know. How can we give God our all and continue to serve Him? Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we come before You and humbly ask that You would be with us during this time. Lord, we know that everything that we say and do here would be a total waste if You were not here and if You were not empowering everything, God. And so we ask for Your presence. We ask for Your Holy Spirit to come and fill this place in our hearts Lord, that You would open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive what You have for us this morning. Lord, would You help us deal with this issue of, of moving forward in our faith while battling uncertainties and show us the hope that we have in Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When our son Judah was about three or four months old, uh, we had a terrible experience and it was all my fault. Uh, I was on crutches, and I put Judah on his changing pad that was on the counter in our bathroom. It was about three and a half feet off the ground. And I put him on his changing pad. I walked away for about 15 seconds, hobbled away on crutches, remember? And uh, all it took was 15 seconds. And then we hear just the worst sound. Still haunts me today. Just boom! Onto the porcelain tile floor underneath. And right after that, blood-curdling screams and crying. And Anna comes running from the kitchen and I'm hobbling over trying to get there as quickly as I can. And he is just screaming bloody murder. And I have never been so scared in my life. Just absolutely filled with terror. And we were filled with so much uncertainty in that moment. I mean, there were things we didn't know. We didn't know if he had any broken bones. We didn't know if he had a concussion, if there was brain bleeding and he was going to have to have some sort of immediate surgery. I didn't know if he was going to live or die, if there were going to be any long-term repercussions. We just had our infant son screaming and crying after a terrible fall, and we were filled with all these things that we just didn't know. But the one thing that we knew for sure in that moment was that inaction was not an option. That we couldn't just stand there. We had to do something. And I was thinking about that situation as I was preparing this sermon. Because I thought how like our lives that often is. Where we are filled with all sorts of uncertainty and fear, especially in our spiritual lives, in our service to God, that it can oftentimes actually paralyze us and keep us from moving forward in faithful service to God. We can be so overwhelmed by all the things we don't know in regard to our service to God that we allow those uncertainties to paralyze us. Maybe you know you need to share the Gospel with someone, but you don't know how they're going to respond, so you just don't do it. Or, or maybe you know that God is leading you to participate in a particular ministry, but you don't know what fruit is going to come for, from it, and so you just decide not to get involved at all. Or maybe you know you need to be involved with missions, but you don't know if you're going to be wasting your time. And so you just allow all those uncertainties to keep you from doing what you know God wants you to do. The list goes on and on, but the point is if we're not careful, these uncertainties can paralyze us even though the Bible says inaction is not an option. And so then what do we do? How can we avoid spiritual paralysis? How can we move forward in those times? The question I want us to consider this morning, church, is what does it take? What does it take to move forward in faithful service to God even when we're filled with uncertainty? What does it take to move forward in faithful service to God when you're plagued by all the things that you don't know? When you're filled with uncertainty? 
And the Bible's going to start to answer that question in uh, Ecclesiastes 11.1, 1, and it's going to tell us to do something that seems kind of odd at first, but we're going to discuss it. So look at verse 1. The Bible says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Now that seems strange to us, right? As modern readers, we, we hear the Bible say, Cast your bread upon the waters, and it seems strange to us because as modern readers, we kind of picture a guy getting a loaf of Sara Lee bread or maybe Laura Lynn, whatever your brand is, and he goes down to the pond and he just dumps it all out in the water and he watches it get soggy and start to sink and maybe some ducks or fish come by and you go, okay, God, I was obedient. I did what you called me to do. I threw my bread upon the water. But what was the point of that? <laughs> that seemed like a waste of bread, God. So, so what am I doing here? Why would you call me to do that? And we have to understand that in the original context, this didn't refer to throwing loaves of bread on water. What this actually refers to is participating in international trade. Basically, what you would do is you would take all your goods, all the things that you'd been blessed with, all your grain, which would become bread, and you would take all that and you would load it onto ships and you would send out those ships upon the water and they would go to foreign lands to help you uh, participate in international trade. And you have to understand that this took a certain level of boldness to do this because international trade and loading up all your stuff on ships and sending them out in those days, that was a risky business. And the problem is, ancient Israelites didn't have Amazon Prime. It would have been a lot easier if they did. I mean, today, we never have these uncertainties, right? If I order a book, I can pull up my phone and say, okay, my book is in Connecticut. It's going to be in Greenville tomorrow. They're nine stops away. Here's a picture of them dropping it off on my porch. I have no uncertainties. I know where my stuff is at all times. It wasn't like that in those days. They didn't have Amazon Prime. They couldn't track their packages. And so once you sent your bread out upon the waters, once you sent, uh, sent those ships out, you had no idea how those ships were doing. And it could take a long time for them to get back. In fact, it could take years. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 22, that Solomon's own fleet always took three years to return. So he would send out his ships. He would not see them again for three years. Which meant for three years, you had absolutely no idea how your ships were doing. Did a storm sink them? You don't know. Did pirates overtake the ships? You don't know. Did they make it to the foreign lands? You don't know. Are they coming back? You don't know. And not only that, but it was entirely possible that once the ships did return, you would find out that other lands didn't want to trade with you. And so you had just spent three years waiting and wasted everything for something that never brought any fruition or fruit. And so you can understand if you were living during this time how easy it would be to be paralyzed by all this fear and uncertainty, all the things that you didn't know, and allow those uncertainties and fear to prevent you from doing what you were supposed to do. You would then keep everything to yourself and you would never send the bread out upon the waters. You would fail to take action. And what the Bible is saying here is do it anyways. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if the ships are going to go down, if they're going to make it, or if they're going to return. But the Bible says that's not the point. Do what you're called to do. Do it anyways. Cast your bread upon the water. Be bold in your service to God. Because the reason this is in here is not to teach us how to engage in international trade. It's to relate to our spiritual lives. And the Bible is saying here that there's going to be times in your life when you're filled with all sorts of fear and uncertainty and you don't know what the result is going to be. And the Bible says don't worry about the result. Don't worry about the fear. Don't worry about the uncertainties. Do what God has called you to do. Cast your bread upon the waters. Be bold. Here's the point he's making. We can't let fear keep us from faithfulness. It's easy to do, isn't it, church? But we can't let fear keep us from faithfulness. There's a preacher named John Sinek in the 1700s who was called to the town of Wiltshire for five years. And for five years, for almost every day during those five years, he went outside and preached open-air sermons. And almost every day for five years, he was met with all sorts of persecution and terrible repercussions. He was punched in the nose. He was uh, beaten until his shoulders were black and blue. He was dunked in dirty pond water. He was sprayed with ditch water. 
hecklers used to show up with drums and pans and beat them to drown out his voice. Not only that, they used to bring packs of dogs to his sermons. And get this, cat lovers, they would put a cat in a cage and shake the cage in front of the dogs to get them barking and drown out the sound of the preacher. And then when the dogs died, they took the pieces of dead dog and began to throw it at the preacher. Almost every time he preached, this is what happened. And yet, almost every day for five years, John Sinek stood up and cast his bread upon the waters. He was bold in his service to God. He did what he was supposed to do even in the midst of all that fear and uncertainty. There was no fear of failure. There was no fear of consequence. There was no fear of rejection. No fear that he was wasting his time. It was just faithful and bold service to God. And what amazes me is that we don't even face those type of repercussions anymore. I've preached some bad sermons, but no one's ever thrown pieces of dead dog at me. We don't, we don't face those type of repercussions anymore. And yet, we are more plagued by fear than He was. It wasn't even a question for Him. He knew what was going to happen. Most of us have no idea how people are going to respond or what's going to come of our service to God. And yet we are so crippled by our fear and uncertainty that we do nothing. We're completely uh, paralyzed by them and immobilized. And my question to you this morning is how is fear keeping you from faithfulness in your own life? I know for many of you, God has placed unbelievers in your life. And you know there's some people you should be sharing the Gospel with, but you're so afraid to just talk to them. You're so afraid of what they may or may not say. You're so afraid of how they may or may not respond. All these things you don't know that you say it's just easier not to do it. And you allow fear to keep you from faithfulness. For, for, for others of you, you know that you need to be getting involved in the ministries here at our church. You need to be involved with the, the women's group and, and the men's group with our missions activities. We'd love to have help with the kids and with youth. And you know that God is leading you to do this thing, but you have all sorts of fear and uncertainties. I'm afraid it's going to be awkward. I'm afraid I'm not going to know anyone. I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm not going to know what I'm doing. Listen, spoiler alert, a lot of us don't know what we're doing. <laughs> but you can go and do it anyways. Be there. Be participating. Maybe you're afraid to open up. The list goes on and on. But what the Bible is saying here is push past all that. Take the first step. Be bold for God. Cast your bread upon the waters. Don't worry about if you're going to find it again. Don't worry about the results of it. Don't worry about what's going to happen. Just do what God has called you to do. Cast your bread upon the waters and be bold in your service to God. It's like the old saying goes, true courage is being afraid and yet doing it anyways. You see, church, God knows that you have uncertainties and God knows that you have fears. But what He's telling us to do is to trust Him enough in the midst of that fear and that uncertainty to take the first step forward. To do what He's called us to do. Just as Peter needed boldness to step out of the boat and onto the waters when Jesus called him onto the waters, we need boldness to take that first step in casting our bread upon the waters and being faithful in our service to God. And that means even when it takes a while to see the effects and the fruit of your service to God. I want you to notice in the last part of verse 1 what he said there. He said, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. In other words, listen, you're going to cast your bread upon the waters and understand you are going to find it, but also understand it could take many, many days. It's not always, uh, you don't always get to see the effects of your service immediately. There's not always going to be fruit immediately. And so God calls us not just to be bold in our service to Him, He calls us to be faithful in our service to Him. When, when, uh, when William Carey said that he was going to go be a missionary in India, everybody told him, it's going to fail. You, you can't reach them. There's a language barrier. You don't know their language. You don't know how to share the Gospel with them. You don't know their culture. You don't know how they're going to respond. You don't know their government. There's all these things that you don't know. And William Carey said, I'm going to cast my bread upon the waters. I'm going to be bold. And I'm going to do what God's called me to do. And William Carey was there in India serving for seven long years before he saw any fruit in his ministry at all. 
Imagine that, church. You're giving your life to God. You're being faithful in your service to God. And it takes seven years before you see any effect or fruit of your service. Seven years before his first convert. For Adoniram Judson in Burma, it was six and a half years. This doesn't always come immediately, but the Bible does say here, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. And for many of us, even though we don't like to hear this, that many days could be glory. For many of us, we won't know until we get to glory all the effects of our service to God and the fruit of our service to God. It won't be until we get to glory until we find out how God used our lives to affect the kingdom for His own glory. It was like that for David Brainer. I told you about him a couple weeks ago. He was the missionary to the Native Americans. And you remember, he gave his whole life to God. He was serving God, but he saw very little fruit during his lifetime. And at age 29, he died of tuberculosis. And it would have been very tempting for him at the end of his life to go, I spent all my life serving God, and I've seen almost nothing come of it. My whole life has been a waste. My ministry has been a waste. My service has been a waste. And yet, David Brainerd kept a journal that moved Jonathan Edwards so much that he published that journal. And that journal ended up inspiring more people to become missionaries and go to the mission field than any other book in human history apart from the Bible itself. David Brainerd never got to see that. David Brainerd never knew that his own journal inspired William Carey to start the modern mission movement that had inspired Adoniram Judson and Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong and all these other great missions. He never knew that. He never knew that his journal started a movement that continues to this day that as a direct result of his life and ministry and the people he inspired, hundreds of thousands of people are going to be reconciled to God and have been reconciled to God because of his life. He never knew that until he got the glory. What the Bible wants us to understand here is that our service to God is never a waste. Our service to God is never a waste. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will, that's a promise, church, you will find it after many days. It may take some time. It may take till glory, but you will find it. You will see the effects and the fruit of your service to God. Your ministry and your service is not a waste. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, in the Lord, your labor is never in vain. But I know how easy it is to struggle in this area. Right, church? It's easy to look around and want to see the effects and the fruit of your service, and when you don't, it's easy to feel like everything you're doing is a waste, right? I know this personally because I can't tell you how many sermons I've preached where the whole time I've been preaching, I've said, Lord, I just want to come out, down out of the pulpit. I don't want to be doing this. I can't tell you how many sermons I've preached where at the end of that sermon, I have literally prayed, Lord, do something with that terrible excuse of a sermon because that was the biggest waste of 30 or 40 -ish minutes I've ever experienced in my life. And yet, without fail, what always happens is at least one person will come up to me and say, I don't know who else needed to hear that this morning, but that message was for me. And I needed that. And God spoke to me through your message. Even when I thought it was a waste, good for nothing, God was doing something. You see, you never know the effect that your words are going to have on other people. You may say something to someone that you'll never remember, and it, yet it's something that they'll never forget. You never know the effect that your words are going to have on others, that your life is going to have on others. You never know the effect that your service to God is going to have on others and on the kingdom. And so even when we feel like our service is a waste, I want you to know God is always up to something. Do you believe that this morning, church? That even when you feel like it's a waste and you're not seeing much come of it, God is always up to something. He is always doing something with the work of His people. And so maybe you're here this morning, and maybe for you, you feel like you're ready to throw in the towel. Maybe you took that first step in boldness and you started sharing the gospel with an unbeliever. 
And let's say you've been having conversations with them for weeks and months, maybe even years. Some of you have been praying for unbelievers for years and years and years. And you say, God, I've done what you told me to do. I was bold. I cast my bread upon the waters. I've been talking with them. I've been pleading with them. I've been praying for them. And God, I'm seeing nothing. There is no effect. There is no fruit. I'm wasting my time. And you feel like you're ready to throw in the towel. Or maybe you're here this morning and you have been faithfully serving in some sort of ministry at this church or in somewhere else. You've been faithfully serving in a ministry and yet you've seen very little effect. You've seen very little fruit. You've seen hardly any growth. And now you're ready to quit. Maybe you're here this morning and you have no idea if what you're doing for the Lord even matters. If you're wasting your time. And from the bottom of my heart as your pastor, I want to tell you this morning and make sure you know that what you are doing matters to God. That what you're doing, your service to God, it matters to God. It is not a waste at all. It, our service to God is never a waste. I, I want us to understand the Bible says in Isaiah 55.11, the Word of God never returns void. The Word of God never returns void. Your labor is not in vain. And so one day, you will get to see the fruit of your service. You cast your bread upon the waters, you will find it after many days. And when you get to glory, God is going to say, as He said in Matthew 25, 23, well done, my good and faithful servant. And So be bold in your service to God. Be faithful in your service to God. Church, keep moving forward. But the Bible says here, as we keep moving forward, we need to be wise about how we do it. Look at verse 2. This is what Solomon says. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. This is the Bible's way of saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you take all your goods and you load them up onto one ship and that ship goes down, you've lost everything. So give a portion to seven, maybe even eight. Diversify your investments, in other words. And again, the reason the Bible has this in here is not to teach us about wise financial advice, even though this is good financial advice. It's because it relates to our spiritual life. Here's what I want us to know. If we want to see spiritual profit, we need to invest diversely. If we want to see spiritual profit in our own lives, we need to invest Diversely, We can't put all of our eggs into one basket. We need to spread them out. That's the reason our church doesn't just support one ministry. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what God's going to prosper. We don't know what's going to succeed and what's going to fail. And so we take all the things that God has given us and we spread out our investments because we see people committed to the kingdom and we say, I want to invest in that. I'm taking what God has given me and I'm putting it back into the kingdom for the good of the kingdom. And so we support Annie Armstrong and Lottie Moon, and Janie Chapman, and Miracle Hill Foster Program, Lifehouse Children's Church, uh, Children's uh, Home. We, we support the Piedmont Baptist Association, the Southern Baptist Convention. We could go on and on about all the different ministries we support, but the reason we do that is because we're always asking ourselves at this church, what has God blessed us with, and then how can we invest that back into the kingdom for the good of the kingdom and for the glory of God? How can we take what God has given us and invest it back for the sake of the gospel? That's how you see spiritual growth. And it's because I know this, if God has blessed us with it, He expects us to invest it back in the kingdom. That's the reason He gave it to you. And this doesn't just apply to a church. It applies to your own personal lives as well. Because we're talking about spiritual profit and spiritual growth, right? And we want to see that in our lives. I think every Christian in here would say, I want to grow as a Christian. I want to see spiritual profit in my life. And I think one of the main reasons that so few people actually see spiritual profit and spiritual gain and growth in their lives is because they take all of their eggs and they put them into one basket. And for the vast majority of people, that one basket is the Sunday morning worship service. Everything about our faith, we tie to this one service. All of our hope for spiritual growth and spiritual profit is tied 
to this one service. And so it becomes the one place that we worship God. It becomes the one place where we pray to God. It becomes the one place where we read the Bible. It becomes the one time and the one place that we have absolutely anything to do with God in our lives at all. Everything about us and our hopes for spiritual profit is tied to this one place. We put it all in one basket and then people wonder, why am I not seeing more growth? Why am I not seeing more spiritual profit in my life? And here's the reason. It's because although there are blessings to be had from this service, although you can grow here and there is spiritual gain to be had here, God wants more for you. God wants more for you. The Bible says that God has given you a variety of gifts and passions and talents that He expects you to invest back into the kingdom and put them to use. So you're not supposed to just keep them to yourself. You're supposed to do something with them. And the more that you invest back into the kingdom, the more you invest diversely back into the kingdom, I guarantee the more spiritual profit and blessing and growth you will see in your own life. I mean, just think about the parable of the talents. You remember that parable? Jesus said a master came and he was given talents to his three servants. And to one, he gave five talents. To another, he gave two And to another he gave one. And then the master went away for a time. And when he came back, the one to whom he had given five, well, that guy had taken it and invested it, and it had become ten. He gave it to the master. The one to whom he had given two, he had taken it and invested it, and it became four. He gave it to the master. But the one to whom he had given one did absolutely nothing with it and suffered the wrath and displeasure of the master. The ones who experienced the blessing, the ones who were actually approved in the sight of the Master were the ones who took what He had given them and actually did something with it. And so church, the question that we need to ask ourselves this morning is we need to to look at our own lives and ask, what, what blessings, what gifts, what passions, what talents has God given me? And number one, am I using them at all? Am I investing them back into the kingdom at all? And if not, then two, how can I begin to take all that God has blessed me with, all the passion, all the talent, all the gifts, and use them for His glory and for the progression of the kingdom and the sake of the gospel? I mean, yeah, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to succeed and you don't know what's going to fail. But the Bible says don't worry about that. Take what God has given you and be wise. Invest it back into the kingdom and you will see spiritual profit. And the Bible says the best time to do that is right now. I want you to look at verses 3 and 4. The Bible says here, If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow. And he who regards the clouds will not reap. You have the picture here of two farmers. And if you're here this morning and you have anything to do with gardening or farming, you're going to know all about this verse. (laughs) Because you have two farmers. And one farmer goes out and says, all right, it's time to plant the seed. I need to do that today. And he goes outside and he looks up and he says, yeah, a little cloudy. (laughs) Now it's probably not the best time. I would prefer it to be a little bit clearer weather. And so I'll I'll come back. I'll do it another day. And and then the farmer comes out another day and says, today's the day. I need to plant my seed. That's what I'm supposed to do. And so today's the day. And he looks at the ground and he goes, eh, ground's a little wet. It's not ideal. It's not what you want it to be. And so he says, not today. And he keeps coming outside and seeing the weather and seeing what it looks like and deciding that's not how he wants it to be. And so he's not going to do anything. And the other farmer's just as bad because he goes outside and he actually has a harvest and it's ready to be picked. And he goes, all right, I'm going to bring in the harvest today. And then he looks and he goes, you know what? A little windy. I would hate for to get blown over in the wind or lose something in the dirt or something. And so, little windy, I'll come back another day. Comes out another day and he says, you know, I like the harvest that I see, but it could be better. I would prefer it to be a little bit bigger. I'm going to give it some time. And he keeps making excuses. And the picture you have here are two farmers who are plagued by uncertainty and who are absolutely not going to do anything unless their ideal situation comes along. I mean, there's so much they don't know. What if it storms? What if the ground is too wet? What if there's another frost? And the Bible says, listen, it could happen. You don't know. 
It could storm. It might not storm. There could be a frost. There might not be another frost. It's a little windy, but it could be more windy another day. Stop worrying about the situation. Don't focus on the results. Don't focus on what may or may not happen. Focus on what you know you're supposed to do. Here's what the Bible wants us to understand. If we're constantly waiting around for perfectly ideal circumstances, we'll never act. That's exactly the situation of these two farmers here. If we're constantly waiting around for perfectly ideal circumstances, we will never act. I mean, just think back to the parable of the talents again. The only one that the master was angry with was the one who did nothing, was the one who failed to act. He didn't say, hey, listen, this guy gave me ten, you only gave me four, all right? So he's going to get a great reward, yours is just going to be okay, but you're both being... He didn't say anything like that. He said, I don't care if you give me 10. I don't care if you give me 4. I just want you to do something with what I've given you. I just want you to act. But I think most of us are are like these farmers and we're just waiting around for all of these perfectly ideal situations and circumstances to come along. And unless they do, we're never going to do anything. Unless it's to our liking. That's the problem here. The reason so many of us are so indecisive when it comes to doing what God has called us to do is because we're constantly waiting around for perfectly ideal circumstances that are probably never going to happen when it comes to life in a fallen world. How many of you can say that all of your ideal circumstances are coming to pass all the time? I've got this picture in my mind. I know what I would like to happen. And that's just what keeps happening. My life is great. Everything always goes according to plan. That's just not it. (laughs) That is not life in a fallen world. And yet, this is what keeps so many of us from actually serving God. I was counseling a man one time. In my office, counseling this man. His life was falling apart. His life was in shambles. He lost his marriage. He was completely estranged from his family. He had been living a life of sin and he was broken. I mean, just bawling. Grown man crying in my office. Everything was in shambles. And I said, listen, here's what you need to do. You need to get right with God. You need to turn from this sinful lifestyle. There's hope in Jesus. So so turn from this sin. Get rid of it. Push past it and commit yourself to Jesus. Now is the time to get right with God. And he said to me, I know that's what I need to do. But there's some other things I need to do first. There's some, there's some things I, I want to do before I become a Christian. There's some things I want to accomplish. There's some things I want to get right. He said, I need to go and, and get a lot of things right in my life, and then I become a Christian. And I was thinking, how sad is that? He's got this perfectly ideal situation of when he will become a Christian. He could have died the second he left my office. You don't know how long you're going to live. And so I told him that. I said, listen, you're waiting around for a situation that might not ever come. You can't afford to do that. I said, you need to repent of that sin now. You need to turn to Jesus now. You're doing the exact opposite of what the Bible says to do. The Bible doesn't say, go and clean your life up and then come to Jesus. The Bible doesn't say, go and fix everything in your life and then come to Jesus. The Bible says, bring me the broken. Bring me the weary. Bring me those who are covered in sin and filthy and dirty and feel unforgivable and feel like they can never stand in the sight of God. Bring me those people and I will make them white as snow. I told him, you have no hope in going and trying to clean your life up. Your hope is in Jesus. And now is the perfect time for that. This perfectly ideal situation might not ever come, but you have right now. And now's the best time to act. So get right with God today. Turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. I think this is the reason so many people never join a church as well. You have a lot of people who go and they'll visit a church for a long time, maybe months, maybe years. And they say, I like the church. I want to keep visiting. But but I'm not going to commit and become a member of that church, even though the Bible says that we're called to be members of one body, a local church. Church membership's important. But what happens is people say, I want to just keep visiting and I'm going to wait and I'm going to see what happens. I'll see if they grow, if they don't grow. I'll see if a division pops up, how they handle it. I'll see if they're able to add more people here or there. I'll see what this ministry begins to look like. I'll see how they interact with the community. I've got this idea of what I want my perfect, ideal church to look like. And when they fit that picture, I'll commit myself then. Let me tell you something. 
I've been in ministry for a long time now, and I've been around ministry for a lot longer. And anybody else who has been can tell you this as well. There is no such thing as the perfect church. Amen? There's no such thing as the perfect church. You're never going to find your perfectly ideal church where you're going to just feel comfortable committing right off the bat. Here's why. The church is full of a bunch of broken people. None of us are perfect. We're not better than the outsiders. We're not better than all these other people in the world. We're just a bunch of broken people who are daily dependent upon the mercy and grace of God that we have in Jesus Christ. We're just a bunch of redeemed sinners trying to glorify God and live lives that are pleasing to Him while He gives us life. That's all we are. This isn't a, a, a museum of saints. It's a hospital for the broken. And so listen, you're not going to find your perfect church. But the Bible says don't worry about that. Don't worry about all the questions you have with the church. Don't worry about finding that perfectly ideal situation. The Bible says focus on doing what God has called you to do. And if you're a Christian, God has said commit yourself. Become a member of a local body of believers and say, listen, Lord, I know they're broken. I know they have their problems. I know they're messed up, but they're my people and I'm going to do life with them. The Bible is saying, don't be indecisive. Take action for God. And so even when we're filled with uncertainty, God calls us to be bold in our service to Him. And He calls us to be faithful in our service to Him. And He calls us to invest wisely in the kingdom and to be decisive in our service for Him. But I hope that you've seen throughout this sermon that all of these things that God calls us to be are absolutely rooted in and grounded in something else. I want you to look at verses 5 and 6 very quickly. The Bible says, as you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. You do not know the work of God who makes everything. So in the morning, sow your seed. And in the evening, withhold not your hand. For you don't know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. What the Bible is saying here, the whole point of Solomon's passage this morning is this. In order to move forward in faithful service to God, even when we're filled with uncertainty, we must trust in God and His sovereignty. That's how you do it, church. When you're filled with those fears, when you're filled with all sorts of uncertainty, God, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to come my way. I don't know how I can move forward. God, I am completely immobilized and paralyzed by all of these uncertainties and these fears. God, I don't know how I'm going to continue and move forward. God says, here's how you do it. You trust in me and in my sovereignty. And it's because of this that we can be all the things that God calls us to be in this passage. We can be bold in our service to God because listen, even though we may not know what the future holds, we know Him who holds the future in His hands. Amen? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the future holds, but I know the One who's sovereign over all things. And I'm trusting in Him. And the more that we do that, the more that we truly trust in Him and in His sovereignty, the more we can do what God has called us to do, the more we can be bold, the more we can cast our bread upon the waters and be bold in our service to God. We can do what William Carey said and attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. We can be faithful in our service to God even when we don't know the effects of our service or the fruit of our service by trusting in God and in His sovereignty. By trusting that our labor in the Lord is never in vain. By trusting that God will not allow our works to be in vain. That He will not allow His Word to return void. That even when we don't know what God is up to, we can trust He's always up to something. Because we know that God works all things for our good and for His glory. And so we can trust Him. Even when I don't see the effects, Lord, even when I don't see all the fruit, I'm going to trust in God and in His sovereignty. It's as Adoniram Judson said, we may sow on Burma's barren plain, but we will reap on Zion's golden shore. We can be faithful in our service to God because He is God and He is sovereign. We can be wise in our spiritual investments and invest diversely even when we don't know what will succeed or fail by trusting in God and in His sovereignty. By trusting that He works 
all things according to the counsel of His will. There is not a single thing that happens in this world that is outside of the sovereign hand of God. He is sovereign over all things. The Bible says God does whatever He pleases. And so I can trust that whatever I'm investing into the kingdom, God's doing something with it. I'm not responsible for what happens to it. I'm just responsible for how I take what God has given me and invest it back in the kingdom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all that God's given me, I'm going to invest it back, and I'm going to say, the rest is in your hands, God. Do with it what you will. I'm just called to invest it back. And we can be decisive and take an action. Even when our circumstances are not perfectly ideal, church. Even when those circumstances don't come around. And it's not to our liking. Even when we don't know what will happen, we can do so by trusting in God and in His sovereignty. That though it may seem like a daunting task to take that first step forward, when you're filled with uncertainty, we need to remember that God just calls us to simple, faithful obedience. That's all. He's not saying you have to be the next William Carey, the next Adoniram Judson, the next David Brainerd. You're not having to be the next Billy Graham or Charles Spurgeon. God just says, just simple, faithful obedience. Just step forward and trust as you do. Do what I've called you to do and trust me as you do it. You, you see, He's calling us to this type of obedience, but the results are in His hands. And that's freeing to us, isn't it? So it doesn't matter if I'm going to sow. It doesn't matter if I'm going to water. You know who's going to give the increase? God. He's the only one who's sovereign over the results. And that is freeing for us. The Bible says in Matthew 16, 18, the very words of Jesus, Jesus said, I will build my church in the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So listen to me. That means ultimately the growth of the church and the success of the church, the existence of the church, is not ultimately dependent upon you. Jesus will build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Meaning you don't have to be perfect, just faithful. Just do what God is calling you to do. Leave the results in His hands trusting that He is sovereign and He is going to accomplish His will. So church, in this life, you're going to be filled with all sorts of uncertainties. There's going to be a lot of stuff that we don't know when it comes to living life in a fallen world. And if we're not careful, those uncertainties can paralyze us. In those moments, I want us to remember that inaction is not an option. And when you're wondering how you can possibly continue, how you can possibly move forward, how you can possibly do what God is calling you to do and, and be faithful in your service to Him when you don't even know what's the, what the future holds and you're just plagued by all this fear, I want you to remember God and look to Him. Look to His sovereignty. Look to someone that is greater than yourself and your circumstances and your uncertainties. The Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, He is able to do far above and beyond all you can even think or imagine. So, so stop worrying about all the things you don't know. Stop worrying about all the things that could or could not happen. Stop allowing this to immobilize you and paralyze you and just step forward in simple, faithful obedience. Be bold for God. Be faithful for God. Be wise for God. Be decisive for God. Cast your bread upon the waters and leave the rest to Him. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, apart from You, we are nothing. And apart from You, we can be nothing. And apart from You, our service is nothing. Lord, we know that unless You build the house, those who labor do so in vain. Lord, we want to help build the house. But we are so often plagued by these fears and these uncertainties, by all the things that we don't know, that we never pick up the hammer. We never step forward and do what You have so clearly called us to do. We're a people who are complacent, and so often unfaithful. 
And so God, what we're asking for this morning is that You would convict us. That You would relieve us of our fears and on our, our uncertainties. That You would fix our eyes upon Jesus and be content to say, where He leads, I will follow. Be content not to know what's going to happen. Be content not to know how our service is being used. Be content with not perfectly ideal circumstances. And just step forward anyways. God, apart from You and Your grace, we will never do that. And so we ask for that this morning. That You would give us the grace and the courage we need to step forward in simple, faithful obedience and cast our bread upon the waters. And may You get glory for it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.